Uh, it's just to displace any rumors or whatever. We've got Don back, but because he's back, Pastor left. No, just kidding. No. <laughs> Pastor is in North Carolina visiting his mom and his, his sister. He hasn't seen her for over two and a half years, and he felt like it was time. They actually had this planned for a while uh, before he got sick, and um, I'm glad he didn't cancel it because he needs to go and see his mom. He hasn't seen her for a while, so uh, family time. It's a good thing. Well, let's start off like we normally do. Does anybody have a praise report or a testimony they want to share? I praise God for the warm weather. <laughs> yes. I yes. praise God for no broken pipes. Yes. And I praise God for a generator and plenty of gas. <laughs> yes, amen. Amen. Paul. Um, of course, the electric didn't go off in my house, and, but my daughter's did, and she came over and stayed with me for a few days, but... Uh, when she went back home, there was no damage in her house. Amen. Then she went down to the middle school in Bloom Grove, and there was extensive damage except her room, and all of her supplies were intact. And Praise, God. Praise the Lord. And we just figured that was no coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and I don't, sometimes I almost feel embarrassed because we do have that hedge of protection and that favor. But then I'm thinking, no, we need to praise God that we have that and that we can have a confidence in that. I, I know that I saw one of the pastors in Fort Worth at that big pileup that they had. There was one black car that was in the middle of it all that was not touched. And it was a member of the church that was right across the street from the highway. And I'm thinking, wow. We do have a hedge of protection, and we need to be grateful and thankful for that. And uh, we, we do have favor, and I know that somebody a couple weeks ago asked for a favor. We have that, and, and we, we're just blessed in so many ways. Any other praise reports? Well, I'm thankful they're out there tearing my carpet out. <laughs> yes. Well, and we've, we've had several in the church who's had some pus, busted pipes and, uh, you know, God's, God's helping them through that even. So, praise the Lord. Well, I'll get some new cord. Yeah. <laughs> get your house. Yeah. I have a prayer request. Okay. We've been looking all day and day since 6.30 this morning for a pickup for my grandson. I know God's got one out there because I pray and believe him for it. Just pray okay. that we find it quickly. Yes. And that they can... Stop taking the kids to school. Let's go. I remember something your wife said uh, one day. I said, no. She said, I have to take my grandson. No, she said, I said, I'm sorry you have to take your grandson. She said, oh, I'm glad I get to take my grandson. That's a, yeah. What a blessing that was. But I think, as my pastor's wife said, I failed with this. You want to do it again? I feel doing it. Well, let's all stand. And we'll pray for this truck, and then we'll pray for their service, and then we'll we'll take prayer requests a little bit later on in the service. Okay, let's let's start with a word of prayer. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah! 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah! 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 Lord, we thank you and praise you and worship you and want to honor you with everything with our whole being. We thank you for these praise reports and these testimonies. And Lord, we even thank you for this prayer request about a truck. You, you know every little detail in our lives and you are concerned and you are involved with every aspect. And we just want to thank you for that. Lord, as we come together as a body to, as a family, to just praise and worship you. I pray that you'll accept it as a, a sweet aroma of praise and worship because we do love you with our whole hearts. Thank you for being with us tonight and just bless and anoint every aspect of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome back, Don. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of
thank you that you are there for every need that we have. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. any other prayer requests that you'd like for us to pray about? Okay. Yes. Amen. That dream and that vision is there from God, and so we're praying for you. Michael. Pray for, for protection for her, but also for insights on how she can minister in this. Amen. Any other prayer requests? Amen. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer for these three requests, okay? Oh, Heavenly Father, hallelujah, Lord. Lord, we come before you now. Oh, that you see all these details. Uh, we know how to take care of we thank you, God. We thank you that we can have Lord, we want to be sensitive to your leading and guiding. And Lord, we thank you that you are helping Alyssa as she's preparing for this dream and this vision and this preparation that you put on her heart with the restaurant. Lord, we pray that you'll just let the doors close that are not part of you, but you will open the doors that you've got prepared for her path. Lord, we just thank you that you will just continue to lead her, guide her, give her wisdom. Let her know what and when and how to do things to, to honor and glorify you through this restaurant as well. And then, Lord, we pray for Michael's mom. Lord, we pray that you'll protect her in this mission that she's on. Lord, we pray that you'll give her insights to know how to minister to people and that she can be effective in, in, in multiple ways because she's just been placed at this leadership conference, but yet you can use her there now and protect her and just lead her and guide her and again lord we pray for betty that you will and her grandson that they will find the truck that you've set aside just for them lord we just again thank you so much for listening to our hearts cry hearing our needs you know all the details before we even mention them to other people and lord i know that there's people that have not mentioned their prayer needs but you you still know about them and Lord, we thank you that you are in control and leading and guiding and doing so much so that we can walk in peace, in joy, and in love and in comfort because we know that you've got our lives in your hand. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Amen. It's time of the service for us to continue in worship as we give our offerings unto the Lord. Um, And while we've got our ushers being diligent, um, this Sunday, Nancy Hinkle will be speaking for us. Pastor will not be coming back until Monday. And so uh, we do have a special guest. And the last time she spoke, I knew that she was really, really nervous, but she did a phenomenal job. So uh, come prepared to hear from God and to, to listen to what the Lord has to give us through her. Tonight, we have another special guest. Uh, he's not really a guest, he's a member of our family. And he, as, as we've talked, he said, Skip, I don't want people to think I just come just to church just when I'm asked to speak. He says, there's reasons why I can't be here. I said, you know what, if, if they're thinking that, they've got a problem. <laughs> because 
there's not that many people that are probably even noticing things like that. And we're just blessed to have Dr. Hay, Clancy Hayes in our rotation to minister to us. He's got such great insights. He's in touch to uh, the heartbeat of our campus over here with all the young people. And he's, he's an influencer. He's a life challenger. And he's, he's there for us as well. So let's welcome Dr. Clancy Hayes tonight. <laughs> for me to pull that like that. Um, I hope that's not off-putting to you that I wear this, but uh, I, try to, I, I try to honor my wife's um, uh, desires, which are, she doesn't want to get sick. She's got all kinds of health problems and she's afraid. Um, and that's the biggest reason, other than when we're not traveling to see our grandkids or I'm speaking someplace, <laughs> that, that we're not here as much on Sundays. But we are watching. We are watching and um, hearing the pastor talk a lot about end times, right? And uh, getting uh, prepared for that. Uh, what I want to talk to you tonight about a little bit, and, uh, and if you want to say a prayer, you can pray for our men's basketball team there, <laughs> playing right now the first round of the playoffs uh, over at the gym. And um, they should do all right. They're the number one team in the conference, so they're there doing it they should do well but I'm always a little nervous for them right um, anyway today what tonight what I want to talk about the, as I'm gonna title this uh, it's I titled it finding peace in troubled times and um, you know today is uh, you know the last time I spoke we uh, we'd just gone through a presidential uh, transition and uh, quite honestly, a lot of us are still to this point not, um, not terribly comfortable with, with uh, where the country is and where we're going and how it impacts us uh, as, as Christians. And when we, um, you know, even what we just went through, you know, it's, um, it's great for those of us who didn't lose our electricity um, but there was a lot of stress for a lot of other people in our community that did lose their electricity, right? Uh, over at the school, we had a couple fire, I don't know what you call it, fire pipes burst where the uh, fourth floor through the first floor of two of our new dorms uh, got flooded. Um, we, had, we had all kinds of issues at, at the school as far as that is concerned. And it's interesting, and I'm not being critical at all, it's interesting because I believe in a hedge of thorns also. I prayed it over my family. Um, but at the same time, there are some of my wonderful Christian friends who um, it would appear that that hedge wasn't around them, at least for, for that moment. And, um, and they asked the question, you know, how do I find peace? And, and how do I find tranquility? In the Old Testament, the word peace, uh, we, you've heard the term many times, shalom, right? It's that sense of inner well-being, okay? Uh, it isn't tied to any kind of uh, things that we own. It's not tied to even situations. Uh, you remember Paul said that I'm content in whatsoever state I'm in right? Texas, Missouri, uh, rich or poor, if he was having stones uh, thrown at him or if he was, if he was, you know, the keynote speaker at general counsel of the Assemblies of God. The fact of the matter is he found that uh, peace is not uh, associated with, with the situation. And um, what I want to talk about in this realm of peace is I want to start with a passage that you're terribly familiar with in Romans chapter 12. And then we're going to move to another passage of scripture you may or may not be fam familiar with in Philippians 
uh, chapter 3 and 4. Um, there will be quite a bit of scripture, but that's okay. We're a church, right? We love Jesus and we like the Bible and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and I'm not as good as my brother is as far as being able to just, you know, quote all, you know, one after another and tie it together so beautifully, you know. And um, But I do want us to have uh, quite a bit of scripture tonight as we look at it. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Okay, this is, this is what it says. I'm just going to read. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the, this world. But let God transform you into a new person. This is the phrase I want you to get by the by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Uh, we we oftentimes read that passage of scripture being a, a living sacrifice, and depending on how you memorize it, King James or NIV or whatever this, I, I don't even remember where which version this was that I, that I picked up. I think it was NIV, but um, you read that first part and, and all the, we oftentimes think about uh, laying down our lives and sacrificing, uh, letting God use us any way he wants to use us and, and praise God, that's all good. But Paul says that the way that uh, that can occur, the, the essential quality that has to take place for me to be able to do the things um, that will be good and pleasing and perfect is to change the way I think, to change the way I think. Um, see, thinking shapes our beliefs and behaviors. I can tell you, if I know you well enough and I watch you long enough, I can tell you what you really think by watching your behavior. Because your behavior will uh, is a telltale sign of what you, the way you process and the way you think. Especially the way you think about God and the way you think about yourself and the way you think about life in general. And Paul tells us that, or is praying for us, that we would have changed thinking, right? Now, the way I think, as I said, shapes my belief and behavior. Let me give you three examples of that. One is people who, who think that they're not loved seldom trust God and often act selfishly. Show me a greedy person, show me a selfish person, and I will show you somebody who does not believe that God loves them. Oh, they may say that God loves them. But if they believe that God loved them, they would not have to be greedy and hold on to everything they have because they could trust him to provide for them. See, if I love God and I think he loves me, I become a generous person because my belief is that he will provide for me and because I believe he'll provide for me, then I'm open-handed towards you in my generosity, right? The way I think. People who think the system is rigged against them. Oh, how have, how have we heard that in the last five years, right? The four years, it was rigged against the Democrats in the United States. Then we get this election, and now it's rigged against the Republicans, right? Because we all want to see it as being rigged. And it may be, who knows? But if you believe that it is rigged, then you believe that you can't win no matter what you do, so you give up. See, too many Christians that I have seen really believe that the system is rigged against them. 
and things don't go the way that they want it to go, they paid their tithes, they gave, they prayed, but their person didn't get healed. Whereas another person prays and they read their Bible and they go to church and everything comes up rosy and we sit back and go, why God, this system is rigged against me. And so often, if you don't have a foundation, those individuals who feel like the system is rigged just walk away from the church and we don't see them again because it didn't work for me right the way I think see if I think God is for me and if I think that the Bible's promises are true for me just like they are for you then I'll act on those a third thing that I would say to you is people who think there is hope believe that they can make a difference and they will act accordingly I'll never forget taking a small church. I was pastoring a small church, tiny church, a minuscule church, right, as far as number of people are concerned. Uh, it was a church that had a, a um, great start. It was in New England, in Concord, New Hampshire, and, and, and the church went from, it, it went from zero to 150, and in, in Concord, New Hampshire, 150 is a big church for an evangelical church. And it was going great guns, and then something occurred that was out of the control of anybody, really. And um, the pastor left, the one that had built it so well, and the next person came in, and it, it was in a free fall. After a year, that guy just said, I can't do it anymore. And, and I was stupid enough to uh, uh, respond to their request to come, and there were 15 people left. Actually, there was 17 on the day that I was voted in, and then two people quit right after that. Um, been there? Yeah. There was 15 people left in that church. And um, one of my first jobs as the pastor there was to write a letter to the missions board for the assemblies in that district saying, right now we have pledges for $500 a month for missionaries we are not taking in $500 a month as a church. We will not be paying those pledges anymore. But when the money comes in, we will begin to honor those. But there is no money. If we give it to you, then there will be no church. Uh, and the district agreed, and, and, and I would say um, that was a blessing. That was a real blessing. Um, but I was there for about six months, <clears throat> the first six months that my wife and I were there, and there was virtually no pay. Uh, they gave me a parsonage, and, and, but I had to pay the Social Security piece of that, and there was no salary. But my job <clears throat> for one, for, for six months, was to convince those people to think differently. For six months, I had to help them to understand that the church was not dead, that God was not dead, that his purposes for that church were not over. And I had to tell that to people who were already in the spirals of a death throng in their hearts and in their minds. They were ready to give up. Right? I was their last hope, and they didn't have much hope in that, right? But it was amazing that as I started to put out a vision statement, I started talking about mission, and I started talking about how the church could make an impact, and I started talking about how we together could make a difference in that community, and, and I began to just pump that into them in sermons and at lunches and so forth and so on. At about six months, there was a thinking change. And all of a sudden, corporately, the church decided we can succeed. They began to think differently. And when they began to think differently, they were able to give their energies into it. 
they were begin to participate. They were be able to fulfill the vision and come behind the vision. And because they truly bought into the thinking that their lives could make a difference, the church was able to double and then double again and then double again. And, and by the time I left the church to go to Springfield, uh, we were you know, running in the about 150 again. And the new guy who came in after me, who had been my associate, who had been right there with me the whole time, unpaid associate, he got a little bit afterwards. You know what that's like, right? But he took over the church as the pastor and he took it to 300. He took it to, because this congregation believed. See, God <clears throat> wants me to understand, and if you get something out of this, that's good. He wants me to understand that the way I think makes a difference. The way I think about him makes, the di makes a difference. And... Well, before I say what I was going to say next, let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11. Okay, I'm just going to read all those. It says, I, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless. I once thought these things were valuable, now I think they are worthless. I'm putting the think in there, right? Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obe obeying the law, rather I become righteous through faith in Christ, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience his resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul starts here, and he's going to talk a little bit more. We're going to get some more into Philippians, but, but, but he's, he's saying, I've had a, a mental change that made the way I thought about things totally different than the way I think about things today. And because of the way I think about them today, my life is different than when I thought about them previously. Okay, and listen to what he has to say I, I, as far as how, how this thinking transformed his priorities. You're not going to like all of what he had to say. I'm just, just letting you know. <laughs> but at one point he thought status was important, right? He was the greatest of all Jews, most educated, studied in the greatest schools. He was on his way to being the top leader in the Jewish faith, status. Now he says, now the way I think is, status isn't important, God's power is important, right? It's not my status, it's his status. See, not in this church, I guess, probably, but, but I've seen so many churches where status is so big. You know, I'm a board member, or I'm this, or I'm a that, or, or I get to do this other thing, and, and, and I keep going to church because that's where I get my status. And, and can I say there are a lot of people in a lot of AG churches around this country who go to church because of the status that they feel when they walk through the door. And Paul says, that was me. But now I don't care about my status. I care about the glory of God. No matter what it takes to bring that about in my life, I want him to be glorified through my life. I don't want to be glorified through my life. Then he says, I used to have this thinking, good works. 
pleases God. Good works, do it all right. Make sure I check off the list, go to church, read my Bible, pay my tithes, do all those things. If I can just do them all, if I will tithe right down to the, to the little bit of the spices that I have, ah, God is happy. And then he goes, but that's, that's garbage thinking because what God wants us to think about is that it's not works, but it's faith. It's faith. It's faith. That's what pleases God. And faith demands that I hear him and I respond to him in obedience. And I see, I see something else here. Paul was before when he was thinking, he was thinking about his well-being, right? It makes sense to the world today, right? If things aren't going the way I want them to go, then I'm not a happy camper. Because the way I think, I want, to, I want to organize my life in such a way that life will work out the way that I want it to work out. That's Paul's thinking. But he says, no more. Now I think, I want to share in the sufferings of Christ. <sighs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Who would ask to suffer? Who would ask to suffer? Who would ask to have their pipes burst? Who would, who would ask for the things that the Democrats want if you're a Republican and vice versa, right? Who would want that? But Paul says, I want to suffer for him if that's going to advance the kingdom of God. I will do whatever it takes to advance the kingdom of God no matter what it does to me. And, and you'll remember that he says in 2 Corinthians, he tells us how many times he laid on the ground, did left for dead, how many times he was whipped 39 times, how many times he was imprisoned, how many times. Now, he, he isn't saying, you know, hit me again. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is, I won't structure my life in such a way that I'll insulate myself from the sufferings if those sufferings are what are needed for me to do the things that God wants me to do. See, going back to that hedge thing that, that Skip mentioned, um, I may have said this to you before, I don't know. I was teaching Sunday school in Springfield and in, in a, in a two-week period of time, I had one individual come into the Sunday school class where I was teaching, praising God that their daughter and son-in-law-to-be got in a car wreck, they were T-boned, everybody said they should have died and they didn't walk, they walked out without a scratch. Woo, hallelujah. Next Sunday, we had somebody in the Sunday school class, his son hit some ice coming home, went through a fence and was decapitated. And nothing scratch, not a scratch on his body other than no head. How do I say to one family, God was good to them, but not to you? Mm. When both families were godly families, both families were faithful families. I don't have an answer to why one person gets no busted pipes and somebody else does get busted pipes. Or one family gets a saved child and the other family gets a decapitated child. But I do know this, it's what we do with it when it occurs. And do we glorify God in the midst of it? And do we say, God, I don't fully understand, but I trust you because I know who you are. I've got my thinking right. I know who you are. And if that suffering in some way has the ability to expand your kingdom, even if I don't see it, I'm okay. Oh, I'm not happy, but I'm okay because I trust you. Big difference between being gleeful that my son just died and being able to have joy because I know that God is God no matter if my son dies or if my son lives, right? I love what you had to say about new flooring, right? Good way to look at it, right? At least you get new flooring, 
right? Uh, but at the same time, um, I'm, I'm not sure how the busted pipes thing works in evangelism, but I'm sure it can. You might have get a chance to talk to some foreign people about Jesus. Who knows, right? Who knows? And then the fourth thing that you see in this, this little passage is that Paul used to think that possessions were a big deal. But now the thing that he says, new thinking says, that eternal life is a big deal. Yeah. See, one of the things we will look at, if, if I taught you through Pauline theology, it is that one of the key things that Paul focuses on repeatedly is he can live this life with all that it gives because he sees that life for what it promises. And if I can see that life for all it promises, and I do think in terms of that instead of thinking in terms of this, it changes the way I operate. And we're talking about peace. We're going to get to that point here in a little bit. But the fact is, I can have an abundant life if I can understand the promise that's in front of me. Now, We've been hearing a lot in service about, you know, the second coming of Christ and so forth and so on, and that, that's all cool. But let's make sure it's not escapism, but it's something that propels us to live better while we're here, no matter what that cost looks like. Let's go to Philippians 3.12. We jump in a couple verses because... He tells us what happens if you don't think right. And I want to just kind of jump off that right now. So 3.12 says this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things. I don't have all this thinking down. And if anybody should have, maybe it was Paul, but he says, I don't. Or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lays ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize, the upward calling of Christ Jesus, for which God, through Jesus, Christ Jesus, is calling us. I know I, I'm supposed to love Jesus the most, and, and I do, I do, but I really love Paul, right? I mean, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. He was perfect, I'm not, right? But what I like about Paul, what I love about Paul is he's an honest guy. He's an honest guy. He's sarcastic, he's terrible, terrible sarcastic, which is another reason why I like him. But, don't you like it when the spiritual authority is able to admit to you they don't have it all together? Yes. And able to say to you, I don't have it together, but I'm at least on the right path moving forward, and let me hold your hand and we can take the journey together? Yes. See, that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, I don't have it together. I've got a lot of experience. And I know you don't have it together, but let's hold hands and let's move towards the together, towards what God wants us to do, to, to reformat this thinking. I tell my students all the time, I say, you should not be where I am spiritually. I've got 40 years on you. I got 40 years of mistakes that I have made and hopefully learned from. And now that doesn't mean that some of the students that I have aren't more spiritual, they probably are. But I want those students not to wanna to be where I am. I want them to be open to the mistakes they're gonna make that will grow them into the person that God wants them to be. Because you are a product of the mistakes that you have made and what you've learned out of those mistakes. You know, you're gonna start a restaurant and this is not a prophecy, but you're gonna make some mistakes. And you're going to learn from them. And you may have a better restaurant the next time around. Or the second 
the, the franchise you're going to do. And before long, you're going to have you're going to have more franchises than McDonald's. You know, <laughs> you're going to be right up there with Subway, the number one franchisee of the in the United States, I think, in the world. That may be a prophecy. If it's not, as the pastor said Sunday, come out with a bag of stones and <coughs> and get me. But as, as I look at this passage, this is, this is some of the things that I pick up. First of all, um, transformed thinking, and that's what we're talking about, is a process, okay? Transformed thinking is a process. I had a young man in my office just today. I won't tell you his name, that would be Ferpa, right? And also just not nice. This kid, this young man, he loves Jesus. I mean, he loves, 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 loves Jesus. He really does. But he asked me this question. He goes, I know God loves me and I love him. But when I start messing up, or starting to feel depleted in myself, I find myself running to destructive um, comfort activities. And I know they're not right. Why do I end up here when I know that God loves me and I love him in that I know that he can give me better comfort than any of this stuff could do. He goes, where am I missing it? And I, I said to him, I, I gave him a couple of illustrations. I said, called call him by name. I said, you know, Romans 6 says I'm saved, right? 4, 5, 6, I'm saved. Chapter 7, Paul says, I want to do good and I can't. And I, I want to do bad and I do. And I, I, all that kind of stuff, you know. Basically where this young man is. And I said, you got to get to chapter 8, where you begin to walk in the Spirit, and you start listening to the Spirit, and when you go after that destructive comfort, the Holy Spirit says no, and you say yes to the no, and you walk away from it. Yep. Now, his response, because honest spiritual young man, he says, I know that, Dr. Hayes. <laughs> And when I get ready to do that comfort, that terrible thing, right? I hear God say, stop, don't do it. But I find myself doing it anyway. I want to obey. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to. And, and this this. I don't know if God gave me the vision, because I don't see visions. But I saw this picture as he was talking to me. And I said, think about a, a big field. And you're walking down the middle of the field. And on one side of you is tall, tall, tall grass and thistles. The other side is tall, tall grass and thistles. And, and you're walking, and all of a sudden, you see that there's a well-worn path that you can go down to find an escape. Or you have to go through the thistles to take a different route away from the problem. I said, what is happening in your life, even though you're thinking it's a process, you have so often walked down that well-worn path that there is no resistance for a very quick fix. If you ever want to really obey God, when he says no, you're going to have to start going through the grass and the thistles. And you're going to have to start building a new path. And you're going to have, that path isn't going to be built quick. You're going to have to keep going down that path. And over a period of time, you'll get a pathway towards righteousness. But the cool thing is, is that you're going down that pathway towards righteousness, that pathway towards the unhealthy comfort activities will have grown up 
and you'll have to work hard to get down that path. See, but it's a process. And we want things like this. The younger we are, the more that's true, but the older we are, it's true as well. And, and I just, I just want to say to you that if, if you're struggling with, with, with your thinking that, that is, is more selfish and self-centered and not necessarily God-centered, and, and you're wanting to respond, to shift away from the evil and shift towards the good, it doesn't happen overnight, it's a process, and it's just as hard of a process. It's not an easy process. Don't tell me it was easy for the Apostle Paul to give up everything he had in order to follow Christ. To make decisions to keep going into the cities where he knew he was gonna get beat on. All I wanna to say to you is, Transformed thinking is a process. Second thing that I see in this passage, and I need to look at my time because I tend to go too long. Ooh, I got six minutes. It's gonna, it's gonna happen. Um, the second thing I see is transformed thinking, let's go of the past. I don't know about you, but for my students at SAGU, that's the hardest thing for them, is to let go of the past. Even though they've been saved, they know in their minds that they have been cleansed of all unrighteousness. They have a real hard time letting go of the things they did wrong. And they continue to hold on to the guilt, shame, condemnation of yesterday. And can I tell you, as adults, they're adults too, but you're a little bit older than they are. As adults, there's no room in the Christian walk if you're thinking the way God wants you to think to hold on to that past. The past is over, the past is done. Amen. The only person that remembers it's you and maybe some people who try to bug you and, and Satan, right? But God doesn't remember it. Paul could have sat and said, you know, I was such, I killed so many Christians. I'm such a bad man. I'm never gonna do anything for Jesus. No, Paul says, yeah, I did that stuff. Yeah, I did that stuff. But my thinking is not going to be tied to the past. Transformed thinking, and that's the third thing, is it's focused on the future. It does not matter, unless you killed somebody and then turn yourself into the officials, but <laughs> it, it does not matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter how many times you sit in the church service over there and the pastor preaches a sermon and he says you need to be doing X, Y, Z. And you go, yes, I should, but you don't do it. And then you feel guilty about not doing it. And, and, and you go, oh, I'm defeated. I can't, I can't be who God wants me to be. I'm just saying, get over it and think about tomorrow. Bill Clinton helped us see that in 1992. Don't follow his Monica Lewinsky stuff, but keep thinking about tomorrow. Because tomorrow, today and tomorrow, what God has laid up for us, is so, so beautiful. And you're not going to make spiritual progress by thinking about the past and living in the past. Uh, this church will go no place thinking about the past and living in the past. No place. Great history, wonderful times, beautiful building was built. A lot of people gave their lives, but God did not want, does not want this church to be a memorial to the past. He wants it to be a vehicle for reaching the present and the future. And he wants you on the boat to navigate that thing and move it where God wants it to be moved, right? Transform thinking. Let me just give you a couple more in the next four minutes that I have, four and a half, four minutes and 38 seconds. Verse six says this of Philippians. It says, don't worry about anything Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Here we are finally at peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. 
Can I just uh, tell you that transformed thinking will result in emotional well-being? And I'm, I'm not talking about clinical stuff. I'm talking about in our normal spiritual lives. And it could be clinical as well, but here's what Paul says to us in that verse 6 and 7. He says, we can replace our worry with prayer. You worried about something? That should last this long because you should go to prayer about it. Yeah. And in prayer, God will give you the confidence that you don't have to worry about the worry because he's got it. And he's going to work it out. You may not like the way he works it out, but I don't have to worry if I'm praying. You can't pray and worry at the same time because if you're continuing to worry while you pray, then you're not trusting the one that you are praying to. So is it really prayer? Amen. The second thing he says, he's going to replace a poverty mentality with being thankful. In all things, give thanks. In all things. How often do we spend more of our time thinking about what we don't have rather than saying thank you for what we do have? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit something. Today I looked when you came in, and I observed this. You're all wearing clothes. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I have to admit that, but I did observe that. Did you thank God for those clothes today? Most of you going home. You got a place to live. Did you thank God for that? Most of you can walk. Did you thank God for that? Most of you can see. Did you thank God for that? And some of you even have pain in your life. Did you thank God for that? Because one of the cool things about scripture, and you don't like this either, but pain is a source of growth. Persecution is a source of growth. The tough times are a source of growth. I never, look at these muscles. You know why there's no muscles there? Because there's been no pain. I have not gone to the gym and I have not worked out and I have not broken down my muscles in order to get bigger ones. Right? Now you can criticize me about that. I've just confessed to you, okay? And then finally, he says in this verse 6, he says we can replace conflict with peace. There's nothing bigger in Paul's writing than churches that fight. It seems like every church in the first century fought with each other. And Paul says, stop it! If you think right, you're not going to be fighting with each other about things that don't matter because James tells us the reason we fight is because we don't get what we want. And if we don't get what we want and we fight about it, it demonstrates our selfishness. And if we have selfish thinking, then we're not thinking right in the first place. So God, renew my thinking process. And then lastly, verse 8 of Philippians 4. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. You can put your shoes on now. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all the things you've learned to receive from me, everything you've heard from me and seen, saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. So here's the question. How do I get this transformed mind that I've been talking about? First of all, I need to choose to think about the positive. Can I tell you that in my profession, it's often fun to see somebody fall just a little bit so I will look better than they do? Now that's, that's a terrible confession, okay? But I've been busy, I've been doing a lot of things and I wasn't paying attention and a student wrote a paper and on the first couple of paragraphs in the paper, he was talking about using an example of a well-known uh, apologist 
who had uh, just been discovered that he had been uh, involved in sexual sin and it was only discovered after he died. And I hadn't heard about that. So I went to the internet and I looked it up and I, I read a part of a, a uh, article and as I was starting to read it, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit hit me. And this is what he said to me. Why are you reading this? Um, are you going to criticize him? Who are you to criticize him? Um, is that something that's going to build you up? Is that going to be something that builds anybody else up? Is that going to build up the body of Christ? Maybe it's time for you not to read any more about this man's sin and begin to think on positive things in regard to this man's life. He did lots of great things, lots of great things, some of the best writing out there. Why do I gravitate to the negative about people? It's because my brain isn't thinking the way God wants it to think. And I have to train it. When I start becoming critical, I begin, to, I need to train it to say, no, thank you, Holy Spirit. I am going to think on positive things. Choose to think about the lovely. You don't have to think about the Biden administration. You don't have to think about the Trump administration. You don't have to think about the underbelly of our society because the truth is that's where Satan wants you so that you can't see the lovely things in life. There are so many lovely things I can look at instead of thinking about all the negative things that are around me. I can look at the lovely. I got a week off from school last week. That's lovely. Or I can look at the snow and say, man, this is horrible. This is cold. This is, right? Now, you didn't get a week off from school, but maybe you got some other time off, right? Or I can go to Walmart and I can look at the shelves and I can say, oh, man, no Velveeta sliced cheese. <laughs> or I can look at the lovely. Oh, I'm going to keep my waist down for a little bit, right? I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of making a little bit of light of it, but the fact of the matter is I get to choose what I focus on. And then he says, think about those things that are praiseworthy, those things that edify God and edify others. If I can begin to think that way, and I pray for that transformed mind, that transformed thinking, I am going to have peace in my life because I'm gonna find my satisfaction and stability in Him, and I'm gonna find my contentment in Him, and as I find my contentment in Him, I'm not going to be always having this turmoil because I can find my satisfaction in Him. But it takes a thinking change. Thinking's a big deal. Father, Help me to shift my thinking more. I'm not done with this process by any means. I'm so far behind the Apostle Paul in this stuff. Father, I want to I wanna follow him and imitate him. And as he imitates Christ Jesus, I want to think the way you want me to think. Father, help me to turn into the hard, right decisions rather than to take the easy paths of least resistance. Father, I pray that you would help me, Lord, to find shalom, to find peace, to find that life that is abundant, which does not mean big cars, big houses, and big hair. But Father, it means that I see the big love that you have for me and the big love you have for others. And Father, the fact that you've given me the opportunity to be a part of that big love. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Is he going to the basketball game? Oh, I would.
That's powerful stuff. Let's stand. Let's stand. I'm not wanting to rush out because um, we want you to let that soak into your spirit. But let's just close with our pastoral blessing. Okay? Hallelujah. Let us not think about status or good works or possessions, but let us focus and think on God's things. Amen. Let Philippians 4 8 become strong in us so that we have peace. Let us be blessed physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, and relationally. Go forth and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being here.